Hello everybody and welcome to this, my video on this cute, cute little camera from Japan. A camera that I think will excite a lot of people. It's a Minolta 16 II. The Minolta 16 II is a sub-miniature camera. Now what that means is it shoots images that are a 10 millimeter by 14 millimeter negative, which is a little bit smaller than a 110 negative. So it is a, uh, it uses 16 millimeter film on a special type of cassette, right? I have the cassette right here and I do not have any film for it. So we'll kind of muddle through that part of the video. Uh, it has no light meter, has a guillotine style shutter, shutter speeds of 1 30th to 1 500th as well as bulb. And then the flash sync on this camera is at any speed. So very capable little camera, especially given the size and just how much they packed into it. And by the way, these cameras have a lens that has a really good reputation. It has a 22 millimeter F2.8, which is a very, very small little lens, but um, they have a, a good reputation for being quite sharp. Let's see if I can show you what the lens looks like. There you go. So you can see very tiny, but um, that's okay. Probably still, well, I haven't used this camera yet because I don't have any film for it yet, but I trust that it's very good. The target market for this camera would have been casual users. In fact, the first version, the, the, the one, which this is a two, but the one was really heavily targeted at women and not in a like affirming way, definitely in the more of the condescending, hey, little lady, wouldn't you like to carry this around in your purse sort of way. The, they did away with a little bit of that terminology and approach to the marketing by the time they got around to the two. But um, casual users and women were still very much their target audience. And, and a big difference between the one and the two. In the two, they talk extensively about keeping these in the size in your purse, being the size of a makeup compact, things like that. It, with, that's for the one. With the two, they talk about it being a purse friendly or a pocketable type of camera. So they were broadening their horizons a bit. The, the two was a very interesting camera. It came in a variety of colors, including silver, which this one is, and that was called Chrome. They also made black, green, gold, red, and blue of those. Personal preference, I think the red and the green look the best. They are very sharp cameras. The film magazines for this were sold as disposable or single use, but they are so, so easy to reload. Once you have a piece of 16 millimeter motion stock or a piece of 35 millimeter that you cut down the middle to turn into 16 millimeter high film the same way that you might do it for respooling 110, you just take a length of it and put it in one of these sides. We'll figure it out when we take the camera apart and uh, then the camera does the rest through magic. Honestly, I'm not 100% certain how this advances film. There's, there's like no, nothing to connect it. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see how it works. I mean, not really. I, I don't have any film to put it in on, into it, unfortunately. Um, maybe I will. I'll probably grab some film and, and make it to put in there. Anyway, the um, if you want to, re if you have one of these and you want to respool it, check out the link to the vi to the instruction manual, page 11 discusses how to respool the film. Um, now the, the manual for this camera, as I said, doesn't really have any specs in it. It spends a lot of time for uh, covering rudimentary operation, which is another indication that this was meant for casual users. And, uh, you know, all of that said, the whole Minolta 16 system, what, uh, a, whole, a whole supporting system was available including an enlarger specifically for the size of negatives that this would take many, many, many filters. And there was some support for things that were, would have been of interest to and used by more serious photographers. So focused on this, focus on this lens, the one that's in, in the camera here is fixed at nine feet, which means that there's no adjusting the focus. It's no autofocus. The optimum focus point for this lens is nine feet from in front of it. So that's a perfect shot for 
a perfect distance for group shots or scene portraits, things like that. As the aperture stops down, the depth of field will increase backwards from that nine foot point, so into the distance very quickly. It focuses, it, it, it captures what's in front of that nine foot point much more slowly. The submin.com link in the description provides a depth of field table for the camera with and without filters. And in a nutshell, this camera will not reach infinity until you hit F16. F11 is pretty darn close to infinity with a 205 foot maximum uh, focus distance. Honestly, that's functionally infinity. Infinity is calculated as 200 times the lens focal distance. So 22 millimeters times 200 is, what's that, 440 millimeters? No, 4,400 millimeters, which is not a whole lot. That's like 14, 15 feet. So basically, infinity on this is anything beyond, let's call it 20, 25 feet tops. So at any rate, from a functional perspective, at, at f11, this lens would hit infinity in terms of suitable sharpness at infinity being present on the film. This was made by Minolta in Japan from 1960 until 1974. It was likely discontinued in 1972 and then sold as new old stock until 1974. And uh, it was preceded by the Minolta 16, sometimes called the original or the one. It was concurrent with myriad other Minoltas. This camera had a 12-year production run in a time when Minolta was just cranking out all kinds of really exciting new models. And it was followed by the Minolta 16 QT. So if you have your Minolta 16 II, let's start taking a look at what's on the camera. We're going to start here on the top of the camera. Here's the make and model shutter button, flash PC port. We also here have the film chamber door. I'm gonna take this camera apart here so you can see this is the film chamber door and this is where the film is loaded into the camera. Still don't understand how that's gonna work. Oh, that's how it works, that's a separate piece. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, anyway, back to the outline. All right, we'll go to the camera's front next, which has your viewfinder window right here, which you can see through when you actually open up the viewfinder. This is your lens co uh, cover and your lens, and there's that blue dot tells you that you are ready to fire but have not yet fired. After you take a picture, a different panel slides into place without a blue dot telling you that you have fired and you now need to rearm the camera to take a photo. On the camera's back, we have the viewfinder window. So if we open it back up, that's what you would look through to sight up your image. On this side of the camera, we have the aperture and shutter dial. So this allows you to manually set your aperture and this allows you to manually set your shutter. And then down here is the serial number. On this side, we have nothing. On the bottom of the camera, we have your frame count window. And I'll show you how to reset that when we load the film. And uh, that's, that's really it. So basically the action of opening and closing the camera causes the film uh, counter to advance if you are not set to empty. Inside of the camera, as we saw, we have the film chamber. We looked at that. So when loading this film, the first thing to note is that it uses what are called the Chiyoda 16 millimeter film cartridge. And this is one of those. Basically, the film would go in here that is unused. And then some of it crosses this little gap here. And then it connects to this part right here, which spins, and it is taken up by the camera. Let me grab some old film and I'll show you how it works. All right, so Kodak 200 Gold. This is one of the worst films 
to use today. Anything when this expires, this stuff turns absolutely unusable. So this is a little film slitter that's going to cut our um, film from 35 millimeter down to 110 size. Okay, throw this metal case into the recycle bin. Now here is our 110 or 16 millimeter film. You can use a film slitter like this if you want to have some really good options for different types of film to use in one of these cameras, or if you want to just have your film arrive pre-slit and you don't mind registration holes getting into, or um, sprocket holes getting into your images, you can just use some um, 16 millimeter motion stock. Okay. Now this takes, how many shots does this take? Let's find out. It says it will take up to 20 shots and they are 14 millimeters, which means 280-ish millimeters, maybe a little bit more than that, which is the length of this ruler. So what I'm gonna do now, if you were doing all of this in the dark, of course, because if you don't do this in the dark, you're going to ruin your film completely. What you would want to do is if you can get some of this that has the film in it, you know, ruin the film because it's not going to be good anymore anyway. Get, take a piece of yarn, tie off a couple knots on each end of it, and then what you would do is take that yarn, hold one end next to a knot, pull this out to the other knot, and then cut where that is, okay? So this takes 20 shots that are 14 millimeters wide, so we need at least 200 millimeters. I'm gonna give it a little bit more than 300 just to be, oops, this is the millimeter size, just to give us something to play with here. And also because there is a short leader in front of it. Now, because if this were real film and we were gonna really use it, it looks like you could get about two, uh, two of these at least, maybe, a third, not quite a third. You could get two of these for sure out of a single 24 exposure roll of 35 millimeter film. And that is, uh, that is pretty efficient, I won't lie. It means that if you were to use, say, a, a $15 roll of film, you'd be getting two rolls of film out of that. So at any rate, uh, next thing we need to do is load this. So we're going to pull this apart like that. Pull this till it's got a nice small diameter. There we go. Now we do need a little bit of tape. Do I even have it? Yeah, I have tape. It's right here. Okay. We do need a little bit of tape for this because we have to attach the film to this inner workings bit right here. There we go. Oops. Probably should have done that first. Okay. Now we're just gonna slide this into the cassette. Slide that into the, we're gonna, no, we are going to do this. There we go. We have done it. Okay, now we're gonna take the two caps, which are right here and right here. Now again, this is something you'd want to do in full darkness if you were doing this for real because film is one and done. And then you'd want to take a little bit of electrician's tape or something, and then just tape this around the perimeter just to hold it shut. Black gaffer's tape would actually work even better because it's easier to remove cleanly. Next, now that we have this loaded, we're going to come over here to the back, to the top of the camera. We're going to drop it into, there we go, the top. And I'm gonna run this through a cycle here to advance the, oops, 
Before we reset the frame counter, I'm going to run this through a couple of cycles to advance the film. Sounded interesting. Okay. Now we've advanced the film a couple of times to get the um, ruined film out of the way. Now, this is the frame counter, and the way that this works is when the camera closes, this mechanism, this um, right here, will activate a mechanism that advances the film. Then when it's opened, it intersects with this part right here that is your actual frame counter. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this all the way over here to... Does this count up or down? Let's find out. Okay, it counts down. So we're going to set this over here. Oh yeah, duh, there's a start right there. So we're going to set this to start, which is what I should have just done at the very beginning. Looked to see if there was one of those. Now we put this back on to the camera. And with it at start, now this is the part where we advance it a couple times. And that takes us past the bad film at the very beginning. So that is what you want to do. You don't need to do that independently. Okay. Then one thing to bear in mind about this camera is anytime you open it, it's going to advance the film. So if you don't take a shot, you're just going to get a blank negative back where that shot would have been. So don't open this until you are serious about taking an actual photo. All right, so we've got the film loaded, and I would love to show you what's going on inside of the camera, except that I really can't because of the way this one's designed. But basically, every time you advance the film, uh, every time you open and close the camera, that advances the film. And so it will just keep counting down from 20. Right now we're at 18, 17. Open it, oh, I don't want to take a picture. Well, that's fine. I'd rather just put it in my pocket than waste a frame. Counts down to 16, down to 15. And actually, I guess it counts down when you open it, not when you close it, but you, you get the point. Okay, one of the nice things about this type of film cartridge is that there's no rewinding it. When you're done with the roll of film, you just go back to where we, I literally, literally just did this. I guess maybe, maybe it won't let me do it until I've, nope, there it goes. I just was weak and not pushing it hard enough. Okay, so after you've used a roll of film, then what you will do is open up the back, pry this cassette out, and send it off to be developed. Now. In real life, when you do that, you can see we actually burned through a big chunk of that film. I might not have cut it quite long enough. I might only have cut it half as long as it needed to be. Anyway, uh, when you uh, finish, then the, the roll of film should be completely taken up inside of the take-up spool. And then you would just uh, pull it out in the dark, of course, again, to um, send it off to a lab to be developed. Next thing let's do is let's talk a little bit about the flash with this camera. The flash, it does not have a hot shoe or a cold shoe. There, there was an adapter for these that allowed them to have a hot or cold shoe that you could mount to it. And then um, they were, they're a little bit, not too badly bulky, but they did add a little bit of space, a little, a little bit of mass around it. So if you're going to use a flash, you either need that to connect so you can mount the flash on the camera or uh, you're going to want to just handhold the flash. Now, the, this has a flash PC port, which is this port right here. And what the PC port does is it uses a cable like this one. You plug the cable into that port, and then the cable connects to your flash, and that is what triggers your flash. If you don't have a PC port cable connection on your flash, what you need to do is get a hot shoe to PC port adapter. They usually run about five bucks and use that to, um, to connect your flash to your camera. If you're going to handhold it, you're in pretty good shape. What you can do is arm your camera, hold your flash off in your left hand, right? Sight up your image, 
and take your picture. And that's actually a really good way to do it because it gives you a lot of control over where you're going to point your flash. And when you're using a flash, a good technique is to have your flash bounce off the ceiling if you're in a space and then back down onto your subjects because that mimics the natural light that we're used to seeing. So at any rate, that's a good approach to doing that. And because this doesn't have a focus that you have to mess with, once you have your, your settings dialed in and you can, of course, use any shutter speed with this with a flash, then you're in good shape to just handhold the flash in one hand and the camera in another. And there you go, Bob's your uncle. You can uh, uh, take flash photos. One quick note. Uh, the flash syncs at all speeds with the X flash. If you're using M bulbs, it only syncs at 1 30th and F bulbs only sync at 1 30th to 1 1 25th. But that said, if you, uh, most of you who are watching this will probably not be using bulbs. They, they are not common anymore. If you don't have to change the light bulb after every single use, then you are using an X flash and can use any shutter speed. Uh, let's go through the process now of how to take a photo with this camera because it's pretty simple. You'll, I, you'll need a handheld light meter because this doesn't have one built in or a smartphone app. And what you'll do is you'll dial your film ISO into that light meter and then it will, you'll figure out what your available shutter speed and aperture combinations are. And you'll get those dialed in. Okay, so 1 60th at f5.6. You'll open this up. You'll look through the viewfinder here and you'll sight up your frame and then you'll take your picture and then you'll close it and that's it. One drawback to this camera's design, you cannot do double exposures with it. There is no option for that because every time you shut the film, the, the camera, you advance the film and that also um, rearms the shutter. So there's no way to rearm the shutter on this camera without um, closing it. So there's no way to get a double exposure. Some things not to do with your camera. Don't store the camera with the shutter ready to fire. So whenever you're done for the night, trigger the shutter, even if you waste a roll of film. Now the reason is because when the shutter is armed, there's a lot of springs in there that are under tension. And if you store them when they're under tension, they'll start to develop a memory over time. And that can affect your shutter speed timing, or those springs can become fatigued and break, which will cause your shutter not to work at all. Don't leave your camera or lens in your car because uh, heat damage is not something that you want. It's honestly, this camera is about as resilient to heat damage as any that I have ever come across with the way it's designed. However, lubricating oils getting into the shutter, if they get really thin because they get really hot and getting into the shutter mechanism and then when they get back to their normal temperature and viscosity, uh, gumming up the works or getting very cold, breaking down and getting gummy could affect your shutter timing. So it's a really good idea to just keep this in your pocket and take it inside, even if you're just making a quick stop. Definitely don't leave it in your car for days or weeks on end. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or box because that can cause fungus to grow on the lens. Plastic is permeable, so water can get through it. And once it does, that moisture, is, it tends to stay inside of the, the box and then that will encourage mold growth on your lens, which could really ruin it very quickly. Uh, also, if you're going to keep it in a plastic bag or box, use a very high quality rechargeable desiccant pack and keep it recharged. Don't let this camera get wet uh, because it is metal and it is not weather sealed. And if it got wet, that could uh, affect the camera and cause it to rust and become unusable. And just remember that your Minolta 16-2 is a precision tool that should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.